In John chapter 12 in your Bibles this morning, John chapter number 12. And I thank you so much for your patience with the restructuring of the services, 9 and 11 o'clock, of course, this evening at 6 o'clock. But thank you for your patience uh, with that. And, you know, the way the, the COVID is going now, it looks like there's a, there's a, a giant surge uh, in it. And uh, hopefully we're praying for God's protection and we're praying that we continue like we are. And I know it's not um, what it you know, is normally uh, with the choir and all of that and all together. But we're, we're praying that uh, we don't have any setbacks and we praise the Lord God has protected us uh, thus far. And we're just believing him, trusting him to do so and thankful for his protection. Amen. John chapter number 12 this morning. And we'll begin reading in verse 27. John chapter 12, verse 27. Now, in verse 24, I'm not going to go back and read that, but basically Jesus is explaining, expressing, uh, we're four days now until the cross, and he is explaining that he's going to die. And so he, he tells them that in verse 24. Then we come to verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. In other words, I, you know, this is not a pleasant experience, I, I know. And I'm going to talk about why it wasn't pleasant. But he said, nevertheless, as in other places, I came to do thy will, O Father. He's going to do the will of God. And I'm glad he did do the will of God, the Father, in dying for you and me. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have glorif both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Verse 32, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And then verse 38, we find, verse 37 rather, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said, Again, verse 40, he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now, here Jesus is preoccupied with one thing we find in verse 27 and that leads him to the statement, my soul is troubled. Now is my soul troubled. And though that's not the main theme of the, of the message this morning, I want to say we are living in an unprecedentedly troubled society. We, we are troubled, perplexed on every, every hand. And I think, though I don't think the pulpit should be a place of uh, just running a political theme uh, in the ground every single service, I do think it is our responsibilities as believers in the Bible and the truth of the Bible. It is our responsibility to speak uh, on issues that are at hand as a society. I don't think it's wise to duck on important issues and duck on things that uh, are right here, you know, in your face. And so I don't think we need to run from it, uh, but nor do I think we need to um, make a platform every single service of social things that are, that are happening. Now, I want to unequivocally say in the matter of George Floyd, uh, nobody in their right mind believes that that was the right thing for that officer to do. Nobody believes that. We don't believe that. I don't believe that. I say we, I'll speak for myself. I don't believe that and I don't think our church believes that. It wasn't, it wasn't right and uh, period, period. And it really, if it, had been a, if it had been a white man, if it had been a Hispanic man, no matter what color of the man, it wasn't right, period. Um, however, I, I, I fear and, and we, uh, you say, pastor, what is our church's stance on all that's going on? 
And uh, just hang tight. Boy, what did I get into this morning? No, it's not going to be a it's not going to be a political message. But what what is our church's stance? What is our church's belief? And I'll say our our our, our stance, our platform is not changing. We have always believed that God, God loves all people. We have acted in accordance with that before COVID. We bring in a couple hundred uh, people every single week and uh, of, of different color. And um, we bring them in. We love on them. We preach the gospel to them. Uh, we try to help them. Uh, we don't favor one color necessarily of another. And uh, we don't believe in racism. I've never believed in it. And, and I, you know, I've been raised around, um, I went to college with now North Davidson. Did they purport racism at North Davidson? I can say it was, uh, well, let's not comment on that. Amen. But I will say this. I will say that as a, as a college student, God put me with all different people of different backgrounds. I had a, uh, a Haitian guy down the, down the hall from me. I had a guy uh, from Togo, West Africa on the other side. I had all kinds of different people in my dormitory. Uh, people from even, even foreigners like people from Canada or something. No, just kidding. All kinds. And so God, um, you know, opened my heart to people. And I believe if you're a child of God, you love everybody. And if you don't love somebody because of the color of their skin, you do have a problem with the Bible. But I also say that what we're seeing today is not primarily what problems people have with the issue of race. I, what we're seeing today is an unprecedented demonic attack on our nation. And I'm not talking about one particular group or another. And I'm not talking about one particular uh, political party or another. I'm just saying in general, the, the lunacy that we're seeing today on every hand is a demonic attack. And we got to see that it, it's not uh, this one against this one and that one against that. This is an all out attack um, on, on our country. And I believe I'm convinced it is a, a demonic attack. And so, Pastor, as Jesus said here, not for the same reasons, now is my soul troubled. I'll say to you, absolutely my soul's troubled. About the, the state of our, our nation. So really, what should be our response? Really? Pastor, you said it, it hasn't changed. So what is it? Like, what is it going forward? What are we going to do? In light of what's happening. What's our reaction? Our response. And I'm going to talk about it in just a minute. Verse 27, I want us to see why Jesus was troubled. Now notice, he was preoccupied with one thing in the context. What was that? It was dying. Four days from Calvary, four days from being crucified, four days from um, his life being laid down for you and me, four days. So what was on Jesus' mind was the crucifixion. It was Calvary. And in this last public teaching, Jesus hones in on four um, different themes. The cross is imminent, verses 23 through 28, saying basically, hey, I I'm going to die. I want, I want you disciples to know, I want all that those that are around me to know that I'm going uh, to die. And the cross is imminent. And then verse 27, we see that the pain is going to be great because he said, hey, I, you know, I thought about have been removed from this hour, but I yielded to the father's will. I'm going forward with this. Um, you know, the cup is not pleasant. The cup is not appeasing the cup of God's wrath, but I'm going to go forward uh, with this. And I'm glad that Jesus did. And then according to verses 35 and 36 about the light, uh, the need is urgent. Why is the need urgent? Uh, because in verses 35, look at it. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goest. And then they believe not in verse 37. And why did they believe not? Verse 40, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. So the need is urgent. And I want to say to you this morning, the need is urgent. 
And we can say, boy, this is the most awkward moment we've ever lived in as an individual, as a church, as a nation. Um, and, and I want to say, uh, it, it really shouldn't be awkward because we have one goal. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But this is the most exciting time in all the world because everybody's looking for an answer. I mean, we're living, yes, in one of the most troublesome times, one of the most disturbing times, one of the most divided times that we've ever seen as a nation. But I want to say it's exciting because we get to do what we should have been and should be doing all the time. I'm going to come to it. Just a moment. Stay tuned. The cross is imminent. The need is urgent. The response will be varied according to verse 37, verse 42, 43. Some received and, and some did not receive. But he said, my soul is troubled. You know, everything that really counts cost. Everything that counts cost. Salvation counts. Hallelujah. It, it's, it's the difference between heaven or hell, knowing whether or not that Jesus Christ is your savior. That's the difference between heaven or hell. So Calvary counts, amen? It counts, but guess what? It cost. It cost Jesus Christ his life. And this, my soul is troubled, goes beyond physical and emotional agony that awaited Jesus. He wasn't just thinking about the nails that were going to go through his hands or the spikes that were going to go through his feet or the spear that would go through his side and be driven through his side. He wasn't just thinking about the, the, the crown of thorns that would be platted and driven upon his head or the cat of nine tails that would be raked across his back. That was not just what he had on his mind. I want to say to you, uh, he was contemplating Contemplating the weight of the sin of the whole world on a sinless person. Jesus Christ was the sinless son of God as he walked on this earth. And imagine, if you will, uh, you know how a little kid is when they when they first, you know, get get dirt, a little girl, a little boy. They just they're looking for mud holes. They're making their own. They can find water and mud. They will create a mud hole. And don't, don't ever be so foolish as a parent to tell your son not to step in that. Just don't even, it's not a battle worth fighting. Shoes can be washed. Boys ought to get dirty. That's the problem we got now. Boys don't get dirty enough working. Amen. I won't get on that, church. But you know, boys, don't even try it. Don't even say, don't you step in that. That little water, one water puddle in the middle of a five acre parking lot. And I promise what they're going to, they're going to find it. And they're going to stand there and look at it. And look at you. And look at that. And do that. And then all of a sudden they're going to, they're going to do that one time. And you're going to look at them and they're going to go. <clears throat> Stop it. It, 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 it. It's natural. And, you know, Jesus Christ bore in his body the sin of the whole world. And when we're looking at this, he, he is there. He wasn't, he wasn't so, I mean, he, he understood. He was bearing the sin, the sinless son of God was bearing the sin of the whole world. That boy steps in that mud hole like that or water. He doesn't think anything about it. You get a little girl that's real prissy. And that's what girl, that's good. Amen. Come on now. I didn't get enough on that. Girls, are, there ought to be a difference between girls and boys. Girls ought to smell better than boys. Boys, that's not an excuse not to wear deodorant and stuff. They make, come on for that, you know. But you, you get a little girl and she gets, sees that same mud and you try to make her touch it with her finger. Uh-uh. Can you imagine what was on Jesus, the sinless son of God, who, I mean, his only fellowship was in heaven with the father in, in heaven. I mean, street of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and that's his home, that's his surrounding. And so for now, for Jesus to be asked 
to bear the weight of the sin of the whole world. Oh, the pressure and the trouble that was on his soul, the burden on his soul to know that I'm going to bear in my body every vile, wicked sin that you or I have ever committed. Everything we've ever done was going to be laid upon Jesus Christ on that cross. And the weight of bearing that sin in his own body was very troublesome to Jesus Christ. And you know it ought to be troublesome to you and I this morning to think of all that Jesus Christ uh, took on my behalf, all that he took on your behalf. He bore your sin. He bore my sin. He bore the shame, the guilt, the penalty, the price, the punishment. He took it all so that you and I could be free from the chains of sin, both now and forever. Jesus did that in the way, the burden of the filth of this world was upon him. And it made him heavy hearted and laden, and troubled. Not because he, he couldn't handle it emotionally, but because he understood the awfulness of sin. Something you and I need to be acquainted with before we, we sin against a holy and righteous God. But he was bearing, he was saved not from the hour, but out of the hour. But nevertheless, he said in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Bring glory to your name. And then in verse 31, we see that Satan is cast down. You know, when Jesus is lifted up, Satan is cast down. Look at verse 32. And this is our text verse. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You know, when heaven bled on the cross, hell was defeated. When all of heaven bled in the person of Jesus Christ, hell was defeated. And so you say today, and, and I want everybody to listen to me and hear me well. What is our position, pastor? You still haven't answered it. What's our position on the riots? What's our position on race? What is our position? Our position is God's position. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our position has never changed. And our goal, our aim, look at verse 32. This is our goal. And if I be lifted up we'll draw from the earth, we'll draw all men unto me. So our goal has never changed. Our goal is to lift up Jesus Christ. Our goal is to exalt Jesus Christ. We're not to be pullers. We're not to be promoters. We're to be pointers, pointing people to Jesus Christ. And he said, I will glorify you, Father. And you know how God got the most glory? And we think that the cross was primarily for you and I. Really, before it was you and I, and you read these verses and you'll get it. The primary purpose was to glorify the Father. The primary purpose of Jesus going to the cross was to glorify and do the will of the Father. That was the primary. Now, you and I got the benefits. Amen. Jesus died for you and he died for me. But before all of that, he died so that God would get glory. And I want to say the goal of your life as you wake up each and every day ought to be that Jesus Christ gets glory. And if you don't know him this morning, it'd be a great day to know Jesus and have a relationship with him and to have the hope, the help, the peace, the joy that God gives through Jesus Christ. I beg you to trust him today if you don't know him. But for those of us who know him, it is our goal, our aim to magnify Jesus Christ. What is our position? Yesterday we went out and we've done this several times at this house. We're going to pick different spots to, to, to do this in. We started this at COVID. Brother Gilbert started actually at his house. And um, he bought a speaker and a little mixer board. And his idea was to help shut-ins, but what it turned into an evangelistic tool. And really, it wasn't, that wasn't his aim, but I think it was God's aim. <laughs> And so what happened yesterday, um, it, was, it was our time to go down to, to, um, 
to Thomasville and Clemsville Road right there where Gilbert lives. And, um, and you know, I, I'll be honest, the flesh in me said it's probably not the best time to go down to the corner of Thomasville and Clemsville Road. I know none of you would have thought that. Come on now, you can smile at least, okay? But I, I'm thinking, you know, it's probably not the best day to do an evangelistic meeting at the corner of Thomas and Clemens Road. Just not. But something inside of me said, yeah, you, you, you do need to go. And so Gilbert asked me to preach. And honestly, I was a little even put back at that because I like to go down and hand out tracts on the corner. That's where the action's at, Brother John. He was down there. We had six men down there. And then Cat and Gilbert and me was up at the house. And I was going to preach. And we made a makeshift uh, podium out of this, uh, I think it was this garbage can. Yes. <laughs> Put a sheet over it. And, uh, and I'm going to preach there. And, um, and so my, my big, the biggest thing for me was, you know, um, I want to use my time wisely. And so for something to be worth my time, I wanted to, not that I'm, and I'm not special, but I want to be a good steward of God's time. Amen. So I wanted to make sure that I was being able to see people and, and hand out gospel, the gospel and be, be effective. And so the thing that lured me down there was that corner. I wanted to go down there and hand out tracts on the corner. So Gilbert said yesterday, he said, you're preaching Saturday. I said, okay. And I'm almost bummed out thinking, I got to step up there and preach. to Brother Gilbert and Miss Cat, though I love them, there's nobody else out here. And Brother John, Brother Jerry, Brother Bobby, Brother Kevin... Who else? Brother Clint? Brother Sam? Was down on the corner handing out tracts. This is where I kind of wanted to be. Probably handed out 300 tracts in less than 45 minutes. So I'm thinking, and people just want them. Want them. And, and so I, I'm kind of feeling sorry for myself, Brother Drew, thinking, here you are stuck up here. And they're down there having fun. Like a little kid, you know. They're over there playing and I got to stay inside, you know. And so I got up there and I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I got my message. I got my Bible. I turned to John 14. I've still got a bad spirit because I'm looking at them down there passing out tracks. Brother John's aggressive, man. He's passing out tracks, shouting, hollering. I'm thinking, here you are stuck up here in no man's land. I know y'all would never think that, but I did. And so I started preaching out of John 14 and I see this guy come out the, the, the door, 6'5", and, and he was in the neighborhood of 350, and I'm going to tell you, it was a big neighborhood. This guy was, and I'm not making fun, I'm just saying he was a, a big fella. Had on a flat bill hat. I thought, all right, here we go. This is not going to be good right here. And so he sits down on the porch, and I thought, He's waiting on somebody. Well, man, you know, like a preacher, if you, like sharks and blood, if, 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 if I see people, like it's not very exciting to preach to nobody. So when I see somebody, man, I got fired up. I thought this guy don't know what he's getting into. You're the next contestant on the Price is Right, buddy. You, you, you're getting ready to get it because there's nobody else there. I thought, man, I got to preach to somebody. And so he comes out, he sits on the porch. Well, then I see these guys drive up in his driveway, like three or four guys, white and black guys get out of the car. And this is a black gentleman on the porch, six, five. Very intimidating figure, let's put it that way. And so I'm thinking, well, and, and then all of a sudden he makes him be quiet and he's standing there looking right at me. I thought, this is great. Gilbert, can I run in the house here? It's getting ready to get on. And I, I wasn't really paying attention. I was just preaching. I did know that they were out there because that's when I started preaching hard. I thought, man, if I'm going to preach and they start, if they're going to be here, I'm going to let them have it. Well, I mean, they're going to get something. I'm going to give them the gospel right here. If they're here, I mean, I can see them. I don't know what they're doing, but I'm preaching. And so I was preaching. And, and then... I got done preaching and I sit down and it, it, it was good. I mean, it, it, I had great liberty just preaching outside, people coming by. And so I go sit down and I'm getting somewhere with this long illustration. I go sit down and, and Miss Cat goes over to cross the street to talk to this guy. I mean, he's huge. Can I get, 
can you just understand what I'm telling you right here? This is a big guy. Very intimidating. And Miss Cat goes over to talk to him. I thought, and I didn't know who he was. So I thought, yeah, that's that's real good. You're sitting here, you just preach. He's mad at your preaching, and she's going to talk to him and straighten out this mess. While you sit here. That, you ever talk to yourself like that? And, uh, and the rest of you lie about it. And so I, I thought, you need to at least be a man, get up and go talk to the man, because he he's obviously not happy. Go talk to him. So I got up and I go over there. And before I ever get to it, hey man, that's just what I needed. Come here. COVID or no COVID, I mean, this guy, and he, he does this right here and all this stuff. And I got about halfway with him. And, I, and he hugs me and he said, man, I needed this. He said, I need to hear every word. He said, man, God sent you here today. I'm talking, you got me? You got me. I, he swallowed me up. Let's just say that. And I'm not little. I mean, he, he encompassed me. And, and he said, man, I needed it. He said, he said, I'm going to get my wife out here and my kids. And, and I, I, next thing I know is wife, kids all come out. There are four, four kids out there. Teenagers. He makes them all walk out. I don't know how long they've been up, but not long. But he, he got them all out of the house. He went in, he got them all. He said, preacher, I want you to pray over my family, man. I said, absolutely. And man, I prayed and, and weeping and crying right there. And that, that guy hugged me another two or three times before we left. And you know, it just, it, 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 it hit me. Brother Bob, it hit me. This is why, this is what we're to be doing. We're, we're, what, what, what's, I mean, what's our stance, Pastor? Our stance is to lift Jesus Christ up. Our stance is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, listen, there is nothing that this world needs that Jesus doesn't offer. And if you're not careful, you'll sit at home and you'll stew and you'll cook that hatred and that animosity in your heart about all that's going on. Or if not that, you'll, you'll cook it whichever side of the political aisle you're on, whichever side of this debate you're on, you'll get, you'll listen to your pundits and you're listening to your people. I want to say it's time to quit listening to the pundits and quit listening to the people and point to Jesus Christ and lift him up because if you're not careful, though you may not be directly involved in it, you're so tangled up in it that you're not lifting Jesus up anymore. He said, if I be lifted up, what did he say he'll do? We'll draw all men unto me. Now, so I ask, which one are you? Are you lifting him up? I mean, Jesus is the magnetic force. He will draw all men. So that's what happens. He'll draw. When we point, he'll draw. He didn't ask you to pull. He didn't ask you to draw. He just asked you to point. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. Remember what he told Moses as a serpent was in the wilderness? If I be lifted up. It's our job to lift up Jesus Christ. Pastor, what are we doing in this world? What is our job? Our job is to lift Jesus Christ up. Our job is to point people to the love of Jesus. That is the only thing that can change the heart of man. What can change a racist heart? Whether it's Black Lives Matter or white supremacy, there's only one answer to hatred in the heart of man, and that's Jesus Christ. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It's not our job to take sides. It's not our job to figure it out. It's not our job to, to present dialogue. It's our job to point Jesus Christ to this world. And if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in this debate. And I got my favorite debaters online. But I, gotta find, I find myself, you know, get, wanting, to, wanting to hear this point of view and that point of view. And I can't do that. Because when I'm doing that, when I'm trying to figure out which side and, and who says it the best and who articulates it the best. You know what I'm doing? I'm wasting time right. from pointing people to him. 
It's not my job to figure out, you know, a a plan for uh, this and a plan for that outside of wanting people to Jesus. Because you can throw all the money at at race, division, all you want. It's not going to help. You can throw whatever you want to at it unless you point people to Jesus Christ. It will not change. And what I saw yesterday was, man, to my knowledge, nobody tried to run over us. Anybody try to run over Brother John? Nobody threw a bottle out at me while I was preaching. And I was preaching too. I'm just, I mean, I'm the best I can do. I'm not just telling you it was great. It wasn't great, but it's all I could do. Whatever it was yesterday, that was it. That was all I got. I gave it everything I had. Nobody threw a bottle. Nobody came by and, and said, and, and listen, don't, don't accuse me or this church and because of our demographic, we, we may, you know, we don't, we, we bring in minorities every week when we run our buses because of COVID. We're not, listen, don't, 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 don't think racist. Your pastor is the furthest thing from a racist there is. And our young people, you need to know your pastor loves people. From the day I come here, if you want to sit down with me sometime, I can prove it to you. But you know, I, I mean, I, I know what it is. I went out with, I, my sole winning partner was a black guy. I'll give his first name was Tommy. He was an ex-Marine and he could rip you to shreds in a matter of seconds. That's who you need to go soul winning with. Amen. And, and, and I kid you not. I kid you not. We go to the door. They would holler out Uncle Tom at him and, and you cracker to me. So I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm not naive. But you think that stopped us? <laughs> no. Do you think think it stopped me when they would invite him in because he was black and they were black and I was white and make me stand on the porch? No. Or not even on the porch. I'd be outside of it. And they'd say, Reverend Tommy, come on in. Like I didn't even exist. So does racism exist? Absolutely, it exists. But you know what? That's not the thrust. That's not the driving force behind what we're seeing today. The driving force behind what we're seeing is demonic attack. And you know, when did Satan get cast? Who cast him out? He said, Jesus, Jesus put him out of the circle. He wasn't in the circle, but Jesus put, Jesus did that. And in order for you, in order for people to be drawn to Jesus, number one, he's got to be pointed out. He is the great potentate, the king of kings, that was the propitiation, the payment, the appeasement. I mean, he stood between God and man when God wanted to uh, his wrath to come out on us because he can't look at sin. Jesus paid the debt. He appeased the demands that God had about sin. Jesus bore our sins in his own body. And listen, if we'll just point people to Jesus Christ, listen, you can't have hatred for another race in your heart and be right with God. Do you know the only answer to that? It's not more sensitivity training. It's only one magnet that can fix that. Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw. I'll do the job. You lift me up. You won't have to draw. You won't have to pull. You just point. You point. And I'm afraid. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a personal conversation with somebody about Jesus. Two weeks? Three weeks? I don't mean about Candace Owens or Fox News or CNN or David Harris. Well, it gets quiet right in here, don't I mean, when's the last time you had a personal conversation with somebody about their soul? Not the color of their skin, not what we're going to do. Not COVID. That person in the gospel. When was the last time? Two weeks? Has it been two weeks? Three weeks? Four weeks? Six weeks? Eight weeks? We're not lifting them up like we should. We're not lifting them up like we should. More of our conversations need to be turned to Jesus. You know, you know what we've done? We've lost, we've already lost a generation. We've already lost it. Maybe more, we've lost it. And the reason we've lost the generation is because we've not lifted him up. 
I mean, he is the, he is the answer for racial tension. Jesus is the answer. When, oh, when that guy, I about said his name, when that guy hugged me, he didn't say, oh, you're white. Let's just, just, let's just elbow bump. Man, he engulfed me. And I didn't say, ooh, I don't know if I want you touching me. Now, COVID did cross my mind one time. <laughs> I got to be honest, because I ain't been hugging a lot of people, but Josh, I've been good. And so I thought, man, who cares? COVID or no COVID, this guy's happy about the gospel, and ha- I'm, I'm hugging him four times, six times if he wants to. Jesus is the answer. Only God can do that. And listen, whether you, you say, I'm kind of in the middle ground. That's not any good either. You know why? If you're, if you're taking battle in a carnal conversation, Satan has you. Pastor, what do you mean? If you spend all your time trying to figure out and trying to reason, and trying to get people to see your side, you know what Satan has just won? We have one job. It's not to figure out the answer to racial tension in our society. Although I'm not that, and I've done everything as pastor and as a person to be as far from that as you can imagine. I run my own bus routes. So I, I mean, I, you know, not just that. I've had friends of color, friends on my dormitory floor, like I said, I, I, Haiti, West Africa, you name it. It's not about that. What is my job? My job is to lift him up. And I'm afraid when something like this happens, isn't it amazing? What happened when COVID hit? Did you see any more? You didn't, you, the Bible verses were gone then. Not all of them. Did you notice? It wasn't any more about people getting saved and revivals. It's COVID. And now they're still gone. You know why? Because it's protest. And it's how we're going to respond. And it's our favorite pundit speaking out on the issues. Even if you're not angry to, to this morning about what's, you know, you, you, some of you are angry and, and Satan stole your joy. It's because you're watching too much. Even if that's not the case, if you get too involved in this, and I'm not talking about standing for right. Don't you misrepresent me. You get too involved in the, in the conflict. And Satan just took you out of the real fight. The real focus is lifting up Jesus. It's not trying to appease this one or appease that one, placate that one or the other. It's about lifting him up. And I'm glad he is the one that died for us and he is worthy of being lifted up this morning. Amen. May God help us to to lift him up. The cross, though tragic, it is magnetic. It draws people to him. Somebody said this, that which showed how much he was hated is that for which he is now most loved. That cross was an emblem of shame. The cross, and in its context, Jesus is talking about the cross. If I be lifted up, he's talking about the crucifixion. And we can apply that both ways. Do we need to lift him up today? You better believe it. Because of the price he paid for our sins. But I want to say the aim of this church is not changed. Our goal as individuals is not changed. We are to be busy about lifting Jesus Christ up. And you know, as he said on down to those who are around in the Pharisees, he said they're not, they, they did miracles. He did miracles in front of them. And the Bible says what? They believe not. So I want to tell you, unless God takes the blinders off of people, you say, what is it going to take for these people to, to, to listen and get saved? And I'm not just talking about a certain color of people. I'm talking about every lost person, every lost person in our culture. What is it going to take for them to really see it? That the blinders have to be taken off. 
just like they did for you and just like they did for me. Hey, the light has to show up. How's the light going to show up? You and I, Jesus is the light and we're reflectors of that light. And you and I have to be doing our job of lifting him up and reflecting the light of the glorious gospel. The gospel, the power of God and the salvation is the gospel. We've got to get back to giving people the gospel. Not our opinions, not our thoughts, not our plans, not our, uh, you know, our dreams and goals. We've got to get back to giving people the gospel. Not just giving them what they want to hear. Not just telling them what makes them feel good. We've got to give people the gospel. And man, when I, when I saw that guy on the porch the other day, I want you to know, I, let, I went after it, man. Like hard. Like you're not going to get to heaven. I was talking about heaven and hell and all this. He got me four hugs. People need to hear the gospel. They're hungry. As we stood out there again, I was reminded as I was three weeks ago. They're hungry. We've got to lift him up, church. Let's not get tangled. He said, if I be lifted up. He is a potentate. That was a propitiation for our sins. And we've got to put him in a rightful place. That's first. We got to lift him up. We've got to lift him up. The only hope for our country is to lift Jesus up. And you know, sin wounded the heart of God. Sin's not just breaking the law, it's wounding God's heart. It's breaking his heart. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. We've all broken the heart of God. For all of sin, the Bible says, and comes short of the glory of God. If you're here this morning without Christ, I'm glad to report to you, God loves you. We find all men are sinners, all of sin. The Bible says, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. There's a payment for sin. We don't want to sin and get by. There's a payment. There's a payment. But the good news, the last part of that verse, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. There's another part but the gift of God. Amen for the gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth or displays, shows, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. And then lastly, God loves all men. All men are sinners. Sin must be paid for. Jesus paid for our sin. Number five, we must pray and personally receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, not might be, not could possibly be, shall be saved. So if you're here this morning not saved, I urge you to get saved today. If you're here this morning, say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. And I'll tell you, I'm troubled. Hey, listen, me too. Me too. There's an answer for our trouble. Jesus. It's the gospel. Some of us, you know, is the gospel broke? No. Nope. You say, Pastor, you know, back in the 60s, man, people were getting saved all over the place. What's happened? Pentecost, thousands. What happened? The gospel's not broke. He said, if I be lifted up, we'll draw all men. The gospel's not broke. We're just not getting it out. It's not a gospel problem. It's a personnel problem. May God help us. I want you to make it a point this week to share the gospel. At least just tell somebody what Jesus did for you. You can start like, man, you just say, man, I hate all this stuff going on, don't you? Yeah. Well, let me tell you how God took that out of my heart. One day I realized I was lost. Just go into how you got saved. You can use the current situation to do it. You say, man, I used to have hatred in my heart for a whole lot of people. But you know what happened? The day I met, the day I met Jesus, God took that stuff away from me, man. It's wonderful.
Just tell somebody what God did for you. If I be lifted up, he'll do the work. You just do the drawing. Let's not be like ashes. Hey, let's be like that metal. If I be lifted up. Let's be drawn to him. Let's put him first. and He'll do the work. That's the answer. Father, thank you. Your love for us, Lord, thank you for saving us.